Hello, my name is Daniel Thacker. And this is Gail Biddle. And this is our second interview with C. David Kimmel for the Penn State Altoona Oral History Project, where the Robert E. Ica Library will be collecting oral histories of students, employees, alum, and people of the community who helped build Penn State Altoona. Dave fits all three of these ca- all all these categories. Today we'll be focusing on the first tenure of his employment at Penn State Altoona from 1963 to 1978. Today's date is Wednesday, February 24th, 2021, and Gail and I will be making a video um, of, of this interview with corresponding pictures, documents, newspaper clippings from the archival holdings. This will be on Penn State's uh, Altoona's YouTube channel, and if you cannot find it, you can always contact the Robert E. Ica Library, and there will also be corresponding transcripts. David? Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for being here. here. Well, it's a a sincere pleasure to be able to do this. uh, And it's just an awesome experience to go back and and relive some of the the times uh, here at Penn State Altoona. Absolutely. So um, can you tell us how you came to have your first job here at Penn State Altoona? Well, that in itself, I think, is the most interesting story because, uh, as you may recall, I was a student here from 1958 to 1960. And during that time, served as president of the Student Government Association, was very involved, and they were doing the capital gifts campaign at that time for the SLEP Center and the first residence hall, Oak Hall. So we decided as the students to, that we should attempt to do something to help with that, and it was a small group of us, uh, but very dedicated to the college itself. And uh, back in those days, there was this huge assessment of $25 per student that the university kept until we graduated or left the university. In case we did any damage, he would take it out of that assessment fee. Our thought was, well, since that's going to come back to us eventually, why don't we consider donating that, signing off on it, donating it to the campaign. So we went through all the various avenues to get it approved at University Park, and it was approved. Uh, And so we proceeded to work with our fellow students to get them to sign a pledge that 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 would be turned over to the campaign. As we entered our junior year at University Park, that continued. So we had a big uh, celebration up there that The university's development office helped us to organize, and a number of people from the college came, including Bob Ike and several members of the advisory board. We had a big dinner, had the model of the future of the campus there, and uh, got additional students to pledge that $25 assessment fee. It was based, I guess, on that, that as I entered graduate school, I was honored enough to be able to have an inter or a graduate assistantship there in the College of Education and was in that time that Bob Iker approached me about coming in back to the college on staff. He had this idea that the college needs to really move forward in development and alumni relations. And again, here was a man who had a great deal of foresight and knew what needed to be done to make a great institution. So I left graduate school immediately after being offered that, that, that position and started here in January of 1963 with the title of Assistant Director for Development. Now, back in those days, Bob Ica was known as the director of the college, in other words, what the chancellor is today. So those who reported to him were called assistant directors. So I had direct report uh, status to, to Bob Ica. It was a small administrative staff at the time, uh, but a very, very dedicated staff uh, in regards to the institution itself. So that was the start back in 1963 for that tenure that lasted for uh, 15 years. So that was a a unique beginning. Uh, The idea was to continue the efforts of the Capital Gifts Campaign and then move on from that into securing other major gifts, smaller gifts, then moving on to do alumni relations, 
and developing uh, an alumni relations with uh, all of our former students. So back in those days, there was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. The records at University Park did not, at that time, indicate any student who attended a Commonwealth campus. So eventually the Alumni Association did that, went through all their files, which was a huge undertaking, identified all students for where they initially started or attended a campus other than University Park. Fortunately here, again, because of the good insight of Bob Ica and others, there were records kept of all the students who attended here. That began the, uh, well, it helped establish the alumni relations and alumni files. So we manually, as back in those days, was, it was all manual before computers, uh, had all the cards done. So we had a file of about 3,000 plus, uh, so our initial files for alumni. And we started uh, communicating with the alums, following up on what Bob Ica had done for years, and then started an alumni newsletter, a regular alumni newsletter, and a couple homecomings during that time. Uh, so we had a lot of activities. It was called the Altoona Campus. Back in those days, that's what we were known as, the Altoona Campus Alumni Association. Uh, so we, that was our meager beginnings, uh, but today we have over 43,000 alumni of Penn State Altoona. So it was a challenge, but yeah, it was an exciting one. We also uh, handled all the media relations, the public relations. I was probably out on in the community more sometimes than on campus, but we were trying to establish a solid foundation with the community at that point uh, for continued uh, support, but also extending what we had to offer as a college uh, to the community itself. Uh, I have students from back in those days who still kid me that I uh, had them out, a couple of musical groups out all the time, uh, entertaining at service clubs and so forth. But it was good. It was good community relations, and they really enjoyed it. Uh, but they often talk about how I had them out there more than sometimes maybe on campus. Uh, so we had a great time during those years of developing and instituting a solid program uh, and then when the Penn State Alumni Association did, did the work of establishing all the identification of students where, well, by what campus they attended, we had the opportunity then to really expand upon that. And so those years after I left here in 78 is when that part really started working through um, using the total identification from the Penn State Alumni Association. Was Kay a part of that? Kay Parks was, in, well, Kay Parks, uh, Robin Ica, Marion Schwartz Garfinkel uh, were then, and this is before I started, they were a couple years ahead of me, uh, when they were juniors at University Park, is when they come up with the idea that we needed to have an alumni type of organization. They contacted Bob Ica and uh, asked permission that they could establish an alumni association. So really, that's how it all started. There's in the archives here at Penn State Aptitude that exists the, in uh, the original letter that about 20-some uh, students, undergraduate students at that time, who attended here, sent a letter to Bob Ica asking for uh, that permission to start. And we still have the original letter back from Bob indicating that the approval was given. Uh, so that was the very, that was how it started. So they did that for a couple years all on their own. They had a, a alumni council. They had a couple, there, there's original copies of some of the mailings that they had sent out. So that was my responsibility then coming here in 1963 to expand upon that. And that's when we really began to uh, develop the full uh, file of our alums. Uh, that attended here at that time and also uh, expanded upon the activities because and then we had a person on staff that could help do that. But yes, the, the credit needs to go to the, that group of individuals who really made it possible. And again, once again, for Bob Ica having the foresight, yes, this needs to be done. Uh, so, and actually it, it uh, Bob had great influence at University Park and people were 
happy to see that. And I think that's where it all started eventually, where the university says, hey, we got to, we got to do more with all our students who attended uh, and alums who attended the campuses. Uh, so, I, again, I would give credit to Bob Icke for making that all possible, too. And how was the response when you started to reach out to the alum? Oh, I mean, everybody, you know, you always have, any institution has alums who are very happy to be a part uh, of a, an institution and some that aren't. Uh, but the response, and actually back then they had dues, uh, very small, a uh, couple dollars dues, and they collected uh, from a fair number of people, I don't know the exact number, but then when we started the actual organization structure, then we dropped the, the dues part. Of course, Penn State Alumni Association naturally has a dues structure, uh, which overall, Penn State Altoona and all the other campuses take part in or part of all that. But uh, so it was, it was a bigger beginning, but uh, there was good response and enough to, to keep things going. Yes. So, um, since you started out here as a student, what was the transition like from being a student to being a colleague of people like Robert Ica and Bob Smith and that? Good question. Because uh, I, I think it was, well, first of all, all the staff here, I totally, totally admired every one of them. Uh, again, they were, they were phenomenal people, uh, so dedicated to making sure that this became an institution of higher learning that would be worthwhile. And also, they had great dedication to the students. Uh, again, we were small uh, at that time, so almost everybody knew each other. And so that, that, really, that really helped. So it, it wasn't all that difficult, uh, but it, it, again, it was a transition. And uh, all, I've always been one for being able to do whatever we could for students. So that became a part of it too, as we all did back in those days. We did a lot for whatever we could do for students. Uh, so that transition was fairly, fairly easy. Uh, because again, they were, they were phenomenal people. They pulled me right in and, and, uh, and of course, I was the youngest on the staff, uh, the administrative staff at the time, but uh, they were, Again, they were from, from Bob Ica to Bob Smith, who became the very first employee of the Altoona Undergraduate Center, then became the business manager. Steve Adler, who was the dean of student affairs. Uh, and another one was Jack Zubrod. He was his academic uh, dean. Uh, and again, just people that whatever they thought was needed, they would make sure that it happened. Budgets were meager. Uh, Bob Smith was very good at keeping everybody on track. Uh, I can still remember vividly, vividly that he had small, brilliant orange stickers placed over every light fixture, uh, on-off switch, to make sure that we turned off the lights when we left the room. And there were other, other economic uh, situations like that. He made sure that we were going to stay within budget. Uh, so back in those days, the university would say, okay, here's the numbers of dollars you have to run the, the campus, uh, so stay within your budget. Uh, so he made sure that we did. Uh, of course, the financial structure is totally different today. Back in those days, that, that's how it ran. And uh, so we're very cognizant of how we needed to, to keep things uh, under control budget-wise. But again, they were, they were great to work with. Uh, and there were the people that you could go into their offices at any time. It was always an open door policy. Uh, so that, that made it such a difference. It really made a great difference. The faculty too, um, I knew some of the faculty, of course, as a student here for two years, but they were individuals who wanted to help in every way possible. And I, again, that's why I think the success of the college in the community is due in part to faculty who are not only great faculty members, uh, and believe me, I mean, there were some interesting characters back in those days too, uh, as always, but uh, they were in the community. So that helped, I think, a great deal 
and gaining and continuing support from the community itself. Any faculty members that stand out to you right now? Oh my gosh, there's so many that I, I wish that were still alive that we would have the opportunity uh, to interview. Uh, some of the engineers, uh, Ernest and Jeff uh, was a standout. Uh, Kay Pars come back to teach uh, here. Uh, she was another very dedicated uh, member of the faculty that uh, still had a great deal of followers. Uh, in fact, not too long ago, uh, some of her former students dedicated a bench on campus in, in, in her memory, uh, honor and memory. So uh, there were a number of others, too, that Lewis Goodfellow, who taught psychology, um, and Pat Cellini, who was an engineering, along with Jim Hughes. Uh, Ron Hoover was another English professor that was, again, an unbelievable uh, person who helped students in many ways. He and Kay were the advisors to the student newspaper. And so whatever they could do, an amazing thing about them, too, uh, their doors were always open. You didn't have to uh, schedule a time. Uh, because, again, it was much smaller then, but you could go bear offices back at any time. They were there. And they were full-time faculty members, so they spent most of their time here on campus. So they were constantly available uh, and supported uh, activities like some of the weekend social events and so forth. They, sometimes they would attend those. And uh, so that, that made the difference. It made a difference in the, the relationship between the students and, and faculty. Seems like the administration also had a, a pretty close relationship with the students. Oh my gosh! Yeah, the same thing. Uh, now I got to tell, it's it just uh, well, we 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 always look back at this story with a great deal of humor. But back in my days, my sophomore year as president of the Student Government Association, I had to have a rather sensitive discussion with Bob Ica. Uh, because one of those weekends we had dances in the old uh, student union, which was the old skating rink dance hall of the Ivy Side Park days. That was our student union. And back in my time, 1959-60, the twist was a very open dance. Well, uh, our wonderful friend Bob Ica did not consider that proper. Uh, so it was banned from campus until my fellow members of the Student Government Association insisted that I go talk to Bob Ica about reinstituting the twist. Now, it took some time, but we did get the, in, the twist back on campus again. So, and Bob and I often had laughs about that later, uh, but he just didn't think that was an appropriate dance uh, form at that time. So we had, there were times like that you never forget uh, and again, like I say, Bob and I had some good laughs about that in later years, too. Uh, but that was basically our means of social life back then because there really wasn't anything else. And uh, so uh, we had some great times with those uh, activities. And, uh, and they, even the little bit of budget we had, we as students also would make sure that we were appropriately handling the finances so that we could do what we wanted to do. Uh, throughout the year. Now, um, you, you were talking about budget and and how you um, were very conscientious of, of spending, um, and it took quite some time to get the E. Raymond Smith building in 1958, but six years later, the, the SLEP building opened as well as Oak Hall, and so uh, things have are starting to um, speed up as far as the campus uh, growing, correct? There was That was an exciting time because uh, there was a plan put in place uh, for the growth of the college. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was an actual physical model uh, that I think we have photos in the archives of that. Uh, so it's, some parts of that today are, uh, are true to what was in that original model. But at that time, any students from out of the area uh, lived in houses right below the campus, uh, down through Ivyside Drive. People would take in one or two students. And it was good for them. Uh, it was good, in, a little bit of income for them. 
number of those people were older individuals and they enjoyed that experience. And most of the students would stay just for the week uh, and go home on weekends. Uh, so that helped uh, to find uh, locations for more and more students who were coming from out of the area. So I guess Bob Eichen once again was able to convince the university that uh, we needed to have a residence hall because we were seeing an increase because the reputation of the college with out of area students. Uh, so, and again, all university residence halls are funded by the university uh, through a program that amortizes those buildings. So the monies that were raised at that time basically went for the development and the construction of the SLEP Student Center. Uh, and again, that was a building that was very much needed uh, because again, we needed a dining space so part of that slept, original part of the SLEP building uh, had the dining hall for the resident students. Uh, so they, they, those two went well together as far you couldn't do one without the other. So uh, that really started the, uh, the total expansion of people thinking, okay, what more can we do here and what, what do we need to do? Uh, so that was a, a great beginning and we continued after that uh, as far as uh, funding and then getting into major gifts uh, as part of uh, individual gifts and corporate gifts for a number of the buildings on campus. Now, there were some problems with the, with the Oak Hall building, correct? Was that during that time? Yes, that was uh, the problem with Oak Hall was that the, the, the construction company that was awarded the, the contract for the building of that was non-union. And... Uh, so that was, didn't set well with some of the unions. So it was at a time when that building was under construction that uh, one early Sunday morning, uh, the one end of the building was about uh, about 80% completed. Uh, there was dynamite placed in the end of the building in the stairwell uh, that caused some considerable damage, but not anything beyond what couldn't be quickly repaired. But that caused really uh, very much of an uproar on campus from the students. Uh, the students were not happy, naturally, with what had happened. So there were demonstrations that started initially on campus. And then, and I, I look back on those days, and I was on staff by that time, uh, so what the students did, they, they organized a protest. I wouldn't call it a protest, it was a demonstration. They went downtown to City Hall uh, in mass and, and, and with signs and some good media coverage uh, was again their displeasure at what had happened and it should not happen and should never have happened. It made quite an impression uh, once again, I think, on the community, how the students felt about things. But they handled it in such a great way. And again, in our archives, there's a number of photos and history on that uh, demonstration. So we got over that, and the construction continued uh, without any other incidents for that, with that building. And again, that was a building back in the days when there were hours for the women, no hours for men, but hours for the women. Uh, they had to be in at 11 o'clock at night on weekdays, 1 o'clock on the weekends, the special weekends, 2 o'clock. Uh, so not much was said back in those first years. That was happening at University Park, and so it was extended here, and we being one of the first to have a residence hall uh, from off of University Park. So, uh, but then after several years, then... Students were just not always happy with that type of situation. And so those went by the wayside. But the, the residence hall, Oak Hall, was so structured. It was like two separate entities with a common lounge and laundry rooms and so forth. So uh, the women could be locked up at 11 o'clock. And one of my favorite times is when having lived in a staff apartment on the uh, men's side, the women had uh, actually a house mother. She was called a house mother who was residing in a residence apartment there. And there was an apartment on the other side from the men's side. And when this, one of the student affairs staff 
people left, uh, Steve Adler asked me if I would consider temporarily moving in. That temporary time lasted for three years, uh, but some great experiences uh, during that time. And, and again, a great opportunity to get to know students with relationships that still exist today with people that become great friends uh, with a lot of memories uh, on those days. I can remember back on Sunday evenings, those people who would go home for the weekend would gather back Sunday evenings in my apartment. Uh, and Denny Cosson and Carol, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of Carol's maiden name, but they'd always bring back homemade pastries. So we would have constant comment tea and those pastries in my apartment for a couple of hours. And it included not only a couple of resident students, but students from the community that got to know each other quite well. So that became tradition that we still talk about today. Uh, and But one of my greatest experiences of the residence hall is that one night I was sitting comfortably in the apartment and I heard what sounded almost like a water pipe breaking. Uh, I could hear rush of water. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, what do I have to put up with now? So I go rushing out and into where I could hear it coming from uh, was the stairwell uh, right next to my apartment. And as I entered the hallway, there was a nice waterfall cascading down the steps. Uh, so I go rushing up, not to find a water main break, but a water battle. Uh, between two floors, and uh, it involved also the current president of the SGA. And I'll never forget approaching him as I'm rushing up the stairs, and he's pushing the door into the stairway with his back, holding a bucket or a trash can full of water. And I'll never forget the look in his face when he saw who it was. Well, uh, I immediately took action. He stopped that right away. Uh, with a little bit of profanity and, uh, okay, men, your butts need to get into the lounge immediately. We sit down and, and talked, I guess talk, <laughs> for about a half hour, and then they had to go clean everything up. Uh, if I were to try that today, I'm not too sure <laughs> I would have had much success. But uh, we got that done. Fortunately, there wasn't any damage. Uh, and we did get it cleaned up quickly, but we had everything out that we could get, mops, whatever, to get that. Uh, but they, I'll, I'll just never forget that as one of the experiences that you, you just remember as, as far as how it happened. And uh, never had that incident again, but uh, that was one that will always stick in my mind. And as well as the students, particularly the, the guy who was the president of SGA at the time. Yeah, so there were good experiences that way. And, uh, and one thing that I always thought was amusing, that once the doors were locked on the, res on the women's side, on the first floor, the men could go in and they would sit down on the floor on the lobby side, and the women would sit on the other side, and they would chat back and forth through the door for about an hour, sometimes two hours. So sometimes they had to go out and say, okay, enough's enough. Uh, so, that, but that was how, that's how they did it. So they, 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 that was one way they tried to solve the solution until women's hours were deleted. So there were again, uh, lots of, uh, uh, interesting experiences, but that there were people, uh, who took great students who took great leadership positions during that time. Uh, and, and it was nice bringing together the resident students with the commuter students because we always felt that would be somewhat of an issue. It was back in those days that the resident students started calling the commuter students Altoids. And uh, and that was really before the days of the infamous Altoid peppermint uh, P, uh, I guess you would call them mints. Uh, but uh, but they, that was a name that stuck. And uh, so uh, for quite a few years before the Altoid, which was really originally came from England, was, it was before that it was even here in the States. Uh, so that was one that they come up with, maybe based that somebody knew that, that term of the mint. Uh, 
So that that stuck, and that was probably better than what some uh, commuter students were called at University Park. Uh, so uh, we felt that was a, a positive thing. Okay. Um, so when you took the job, um, what were some of your goals? Did you want to accomplish? Well, my and my thinking, my thought always was, what can I do along with others to make this the best institution possible? Uh, and as simple as that sounds, uh, it's really what we were attempting to do. And we wanted to grow not only the institution and what it had to offer and, and its programs, but also to grow as far as what we could do for students and then what those students in turn as alumni could do for the college. Uh, so that's really where we came from. And uh, back in those days, trying to establish community relations uh, and information out to the community about the college was extremely easy. I'll always be very, very grateful knowing how difficult it is today to get coverage of anything uh, that's positive, particularly uh, in the media. Back in those days when I started, Ted Holsinger, was the, who was the chair of the advisory board of the college, was also the general manager and head of the Altoona Mir. So uh, I don't know how else to put it, but anything we needed, we got it. I would go down to the city room with an idea or I need a photographer. We had it. So it, it was just an unbelievable time. And, and you look through the uh, uh, news clipping books in the archives, it is just constant, constant coverage of the college, particularly during the Capital Gifts campaigns. If I had asked for, uh, to have a picture taken with a corporation that was donating, uh, I got it. Uh, so uh, I must say that it was, it was much, much easier than people have it today. Uh, and again, because of the good graces of those people uh, like Ted Holzinger, who had, again, the most, he had this great love for the institution, uh, along with other members of the advisory board at the time. And that's, that's where a lot of those people at my young age, starting here at, what, 22, they were mentors. They did Ted Holzinger's, the James K. McNeil Jr., who was the advice chairman of the board, and the Joe Cohen's. Uh, and so many, Ed, uh, Artie Dillon and John Dillon, uh, Frank Marsh, people who were presidents of banks and, and heads of institutions uh, were on that board. They were great mentors. They were unbelievable. They would get together every day for lunch at the, down at the old Pan Alto Hotel in the coffee shop. And I got invited uh, to join in on that crew. And I, I mean, to me, it was just an experience that you never forget, but it was such a great learning experience to have that number of mentors because we had a common goal, we had a common feel, and that was the college. And so that, that just made uh, things so much easier back in those days. Uh, I would think today of a new institution starting out would never, never have those uh, opportunities that we had back then. But that's how the community embraced the college and how we wanted to continue and, and enhance that that uh, feeling for the college. What years was Teddy active? Well, oh my gosh, um, he. I, I'm not sure when he became the uh, chairman of the board uh, of the advisory board, but it, he was chair uh, really up until his passing. Um, and so he was. He saw through uh, a number of the first in, in the developments of the college. So he, again, and his family too. His daughter, Marge Helsel, uh, was a a great believer of the college, and again, a great. Uh, I almost call her. She was like a sister. She just uh, just did so much. Uh, she uh, every week she worked at the paper. And uh, she actually became the general manager after her dad. Uh, but uh, she would write what we call the Ivy Leaf. It was a uh, uh, article that appeared every Saturday in Altoona Mirror, something about the college, either alums or programs or whatever. And so Marge did anything and everything to make sure what whatever need was needed 
where she could help, she did it. And again, she's just a wonderful, warm, warm person. And I truly looked upon her as a not only a great friend, but a, 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 a big sister. She was just, just really something else. And her, her, most of her children came here then and, uh, and have been, always became good leaders, too, at the college. Um, so, what do you consider some of your the, the biggest achievements during your time? During my time, uh, what really been the expansion and the growth of the student population, uh, because I mean these were the days before we became a four year institution. So, we were really uh, trying to, and not only uh, provide the facilities that were needed, but we were also looking at the number of, of students that we needed to recruit to maintain a good, solid institution. Because um, when you look back in the early days, that was always somewhat of a problem because of World War II, uh, when men were uh, enlisted in the service. So uh, as we looked at uh, having a residence hall and then considering a second residence hall, uh, the reputation of the college grew. But still, uh, as, as of today, student enrollment, student recruitment was as critical back in those days as it is today. What impacts did the Vietnam War have on the college during that time? The, the, the greatest thing there were the, the, was the return of those vets, the, 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 most, the part that I can remember. I don't think it had that much of a, a, a flex on enrollment at the time, but was how to work with these returning vets. Uh, so that became a challenge uh, for us as to how they fit into the the undergraduates, and because uh, we were getting a number of uh, uh, re returning vets at that time from the Vietnam War, and of course they were coming with some fairly good benefits, uh, but then they they you could always tell a vet from other students. They were more serious about their work. They were here to obtain a degree, but I have to admit too that they were a lot of fun. And they, because one thing is back in those days when they first coming back, we had what was called freshman customs, which a lot of colleges had at the time. You had to wear a dink, you had to wear a sign saying who your name and major. And so we, we made it clear that the, the vets didn't have to participate. Uh, we just didn't think that they would want to, or, but a number of them did. And, and again, I know there's photos in the archives of some of those guys who participated uh, because I think they wanted to be a part of, uh, of, of what they were experiencing. So, so they, were, they were great to work with. I became the advisor. They started a vets club. And, and um, so Steve Wicks, who was a great... Uh, student at the time, but also a vet, uh, started a veterans club, and I was asked to be the, the advisor to the vets club. So that was an experience, too, that Steve, who's an attorney locally here in Altoona, we still have fond memories that we talk about of those early days with the vets. Uh, so they, were, they became an integral part, and it's so pleasing to see that we have a great deal, uh, as much emphasis as far as recruiting and doing more for the events. I would very much like to see a facility uh, for the vets, particularly either part of a building or a separate building, probably here, more of a part of a building be dedicated uh, to the vets for their use as far as a lounge and other activities. Uh, we have staff who works with them all the time, but uh, my personal thought and goal would be to try to have something for the vets. Uh, we owe them a lot, and, uh, and I think that would be a, an ideal thing to have someday. Was there any anti-war sentiment on campus as far as like protests, or was there any conflict? Yes, uh, when I first started in 63, 64, right around that time on staff, uh, we had a uh, demonstration uh, in front of SLEP uh, for a day or so, uh, protesting, uh, and it was orderly. 
uh, I think people were very nervous about it, as I recall. Uh, but I, I, if I recall, I think that was the time I was acting Dean of Student Affairs. And uh, so uh, I had to deal with that directly. But again, when I look back on that, some of those individuals who led that protest became outstanding citizens. One particular became a very well-known lawyer. Uh, and so, I mean, they were, they were peaceful, uh, but yet uh, they made their, their points clear. Uh, we live in a very conservative, rather conservative community. So the fear was, well, what's the community going to, as we are trying to build community relations, what's the community, how will they perceive this? Um, but again, there wasn't uh, m much of a, uh, a reaction from the community about it because it wasn't the only one. It wasn't the, only, it wasn't the first type of demonstration. But uh, they marched back and forth uh, in front of SLAP with their posters. And, and uh, so we, we handled it, I think, quite well uh, on both sides as far as administration was concerned and the students. And back in those days, too, the the student newspaper, of course, was the back of those. It was a printed newspaper versus the online today. But uh, they were very active also in regards to some of the issues uh, facing the country. When was Kennedy assassinated? Was that 63? 63. Three? Yeah. 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 So that, there was a tumultuous time. And for us very much, and that brings back another great memory that I had. I was in the office, once again, trying to get some con uh, some media uh, coverage. And I was talking to the radio station WRTA, which still exists in Altoona today. And we were talking about this possible coverage. And back in those days, radio stations had teletypes uh, so that the news came across in the teletype and, or they could type out information. So we're talking and uh, all of a sudden I hear this bell going off. It's a very loud bell. And uh, back in those days, the teletype, if something of high interest was coming through, it had a bell on it and a light that flashed. And uh, so the individual I was talking to said, hey, let me just check this out. And again, I'll never forget, he came back and said, oh, my God, the president's just been taught, shot. I need to go. So as I recall, and I look back on that, I was probably one of the first in the country to know that the president had been shot because it had just come across on the teletype. And uh, so I thought, oh, my God. So we, uh, my office was in the SLEP building, and we pulled out a TV uh, on a stand that was used for television instruction into the lobby of the Smith building. And everybody just sat there, just in stunned silence. Uh, but it was something that you always remember some historic times, what you were doing and where you were. And that's one that just will always stick with me. When he came back and said, oh my God, the president's been shot. Uh, that was a, a time that... Uh, and, I, and again, I was, uh, I really liked a lot of things that uh, President Kennedy stood for uh, in regards to how we should be treating people. And uh, so it, it particularly hit me hard, uh, as it did to many of the students back in those days. Yeah. Well, speaking of the, the tumultuous times, also there was a civil rights um, for the students active and demonstrating uh, for, for that, or was that not? I don't really. I think in my time, that may have come after 78. There might have been some, yeah. The biggest thing was the, was the Vietnam War um, when we had that demonstration. So, uh, so I would think, and I'm sure that there were times when the students, you know, did participate in So you experienced Bob Ica's the, the tail end of his career, what, what, what was that like for him finally to decide to, to, to retire? I, I think it was a, a very difficult decision uh, for Bob uh, since he had been there from the very beginning. And, but I think he felt satisfied 
with what he had done. Uh, because again, by that point, when he retired, we, we, we had made quite a few advancements in the college. And uh, so Bob was very, I guess I mentioned numerous times, very well respected in at one of the homecomings of the year he retired, the homecoming, on my homecoming, uh, we honored him with a, a big uh, event uh, to recognize his achievement. So it was a several day uh, an event. It accommodated with a uh, big dinner at the Jaffa Shrine to honor uh, Bob for his achievements. Uh, during that time also, the advisory board had what was called a gold medal uh, at the that recognized great achievement, and Bob was honored with, with a gold medal also. Uh, he was honored by so many individuals and by the community itself. In many ways, he received an honor, a doctorate from St. Francis University. So, again, he was widely respected for and for what he did. And, uh, and in the archives, too, were a lot of acknowledgement letters and notes that he got upon his retirement uh, from all over and was well respected by, by, the, by the university itself. He was he was about 68, 70, around there? I think that, that's correct as far as his age, yeah. yes. Um, but uh, he never, other than um, the twist, uh, Paul, Paul was always, I think, forever what it, what it took to make the... Uh, when I think back about him starting the uh, newsletters for the vets uh, and giving permission to start an alumni association locally when nobody else was doing that and within the university except the Penn State Alumni Association, uh, you know, he was always forward thinking but always willing to, let's do it, let's do it. And and he did, he gave in on a twist, so yeah. <laughs> I, I keep bringing that up because we had so many good laughs after that. I never got Bob to do it, but uh, uh, he, he would attend some of the social events. But yeah, if I could have just gotten Bob to do the twist, that would have, would have made my day. So transitions are always, well, they're scary. And so you had to transition from Robert Ica to a John Weathers. That was a great transition. Um, and I, I, I look back again in those days as being something, again, but there was trepidation as far as Bob Micah having been here so many years, what's this going to be like? Uh, but we were so, so fortunate in getting uh, an individual like John Leathers. Um, he fit in so well with everyone and uh, had the same, some of the same characteristics as um, Bob Ica, quiet, uh, but yet forceful uh, in many ways as far as moving ahead. And so he had great respect from both faculty and from students, and he got along with all segments uh, of the college. Um, he was also a pilot, and one of my favorite memories of John was that every once in a while in the summer, I guess they have to get so many hours uh, a, a year in flying, and so when he felt like it and he wanted to get a couple of hours, he would stop by my office on his way out, say, you, you want to go up? Well, when he first said that, I said, we're up. Uh, so I found out that I was going up in a plane with John. So we would have some great experiences uh, as he would take an hour or so to fly and I would be there with him. Uh, he was one that uh, just was able to get along with all individuals and his wife also was a great uh, contributor to at various aspects of the of the college, but uh, John had the good fortune of moving on to become the vice president of Commonwealth campuses for the university. So that was a loss to us in one way, but it was a gain because we had somebody at University Park in that position who was truly understood what the Commonwealth campus system was was all about. But uh, he was, in many ways, uh, similar to Bob Ica. So for us, that, that transition was uh, much easier. Had he already been a part of the Penn State Institute? No, he came in, uh, if I believe correctly, from Ohio, from a college in Ohio, uh, into that 
position. So, uh, so he was totally new to the community itself, but uh, again, was quickly taken in by the community just because of the type of personality he had. That uh, and, and following Bob Ike could be a, quite a challenge in itself, I would think. But he he handled that beautifully, and and you, he would refer and meet with Bob Ica on a regular basis, uh, which was again something that was very special. Now, Ica retired in 1968, yeah. um, and then John Leathers took over. Then there, there was that expansion that you were talking about, and we had um, the, these are the buildings that were. Uh, built um, or completed in 1970, we had the, the Robert E. Yica Library, we had the Edith Davis, we had the Edith Davis E. Memorial Chapel, the Holsinger Engineering Building, uh, Port of Sky uh, was constructed, uh, we had the Science Building, all those were in 1970, and then uh, we also had the Stephen Adler that was uh, athletic complex that was started in 1972. Um, how did that massive expansion come to be? Well, the uh, because of the growth of student population and the university really beginning more and more to recognize the value of the Commonwealth campus system. Uh, and that's always been a interesting scenario in itself. But uh, then there was the thought, well, wow, he's... If nothing else, it's a great feeder for University Park. And uh, because, again, we were back in those days strictly two-year uh, institutions. So uh, I think along those lines, there was that thought that uh, along with what we were attempting to do as far as development and obtaining funds to help build some of these buildings, uh, a number of those dollars came from uh, University through the state the state of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, Port Sky was a part of uh, the uh, overall financial structure of housing and food services to the university. So that was funded through, and but that's funded through his income from from those buildings. Uh, but the the engineering building was some private donations in that. Of course, the Eve Chapel was some private, all private donations uh, because state monies could not be used for. Uh, a religious facility, uh, but then Port Sky, when that was built, there were again private some private dollars there too that went into that also for that expansion. Uh, so the science buildings and the Adler complex were basically funding from either the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania or from the university. So that was uh, that helped uh, along those lines, and they were the ones that were needed at that point. What did uh, Mr. Ica think of all that? He must have been flabbergasted. He, you know, it's, it's hard to say, I think, because he always had that feeling that, yes, there will be growth and will, that it wasn't wishful thinking that it was going to happen. And, uh, but, you know, I think Bob probably felt like I still do today when I walk through the campus. I think back of those days of what we had and where we are today, you can't help but marvel what has happened here uh, based on where the various sources of income came from to make it all possible and the support But what has happened as far as quality of faculty and staff uh, through the years that we've been able to attract some top-notch people. Uh, and I'm sure Bob felt that way too uh, when he would talk about the college, but then, uh, and I had the great opportunity once he retired to visit uh, his home many, many times, and uh, it never, there was never a time that we didn't talk about the college and what either what had transpired or what hopefully was going to happen. Uh, so that was always forefront with Bob. Uh, he lived for this, for this institution. So it was a time when um, a lot was happening, uh, but yet I think it was a, we we always did very unique things too. Every time we did a groundbreaking, we would do it unique. We 
that was back in the days when lasers were just first coming about. So when we broke ground for the for the science building that we used a laser that pointed down to the site. We were in front of the Smith building, pointed a laser down to the site and and the ground was broken through a laser hitting the beam, uh, beam hitting the, some dynamite. So we we had some unique, uh, unique times. I always thought we have to have something different. We have to have something different. And that was probably one of the most unique. Thank God the laser worked. Because yeah. that, that was in the early days uh, of lasers. So uh, so we, we had fun times doing a lot of that. Now you had, we have just about, we have a lot of documentation about the Eve Memorial Chapel yeah. uh, that, that you had. Yeah. Uh, what was your role in that? And and that was, can you talk some about how yeah. that came to be? That that uh, is, again, one of my most favorite times because I kind of oversaw that project uh, from the administrative side, uh, from working, first of all, with Charles Rice, who was an accountant and on the advisory board, uh, who had a uh, one of his uh, accounts was Edith Davis. Edith Davis, Edith Davis, Eve, uh, and uh, she was interested, and I think Charles helped to promote the idea that a, a gift would be nice for the college. She was a retired school teacher. Uh, I think she, through she and her husband, they had invested wisely, and uh, so he convinced her that she should make a gift. Well. She convinced Charles that it should go for a chapel and that she would like very much to see a chapel uh, on campus. And that was the only thing that she'd be interested in making possible. Uh, and of course, we became the very first Commonwealth campus to have a chapel. Uh, so that's how it all started. Uh, but then we needed to raise additional funds for that, uh, which we did through uh, memorializing the various stained glass windows, chunk glass windows, areas of the chapel itself. So in addition to, to her initial gift, then we raised a couple hundred thousand to, to make that all possible. Uh, I again had the good opportunity to work with Dick Truesdale, who was the architect uh, on that building uh, uh, from the very beginning. And it's interesting and in that he if you look at the chapel itself, the bell tower, which again is a great uh, landmark uh, on our campus, uh, his initial thought was that would be the chapel proper. Well, by the time he decided to determine the size of what the chapel proper should be, for seating and altar or whatever, that that building would have been very, very high and very, very uh, wide circumference. So uh, his... In, Initial thought then went to what we have today. So we still have a circular chapel, uh, but a tower uh, next to add. So it was great working with Dick through all that time and those various drawings and approvals uh, to uh, working with Jacques Duell, who did the stained glass windows and the chunk glass windows, who's a, who's a well known uh, artist. Uh, who did some things at World Fairs, uh, and we had the great opportunity to have him do those windows. So working with him and then the installation of a 50-bell carillon, uh, which again was a gift, uh, the, the installation of that uh, to make that building a very unique building that it is today. So uh, the keeper of uh, that I am, uh, we do have a quite a large uh, manual of everything and everything that went on uh, through that initial stages to, through the construction and dedication of that building. And uh, it's been researched several times by a couple of our faculty members on, on things. So uh, that, I, that again was another great experience, working with all those individuals to make that possible. And was the Bells Schumerich? Schumerich. It's a Schumerich system. Uh, Schumerich system is very unique, and it is not large cast bells, but they're finely tuned bars then that, that, that are struck each time you hear anything from the bells, and that's magnified uh, greatly, amplified greatly 
through the sound system. So it's always metal striking metal, uh, but it's certainly not 50 cast bells on top of the tower. Uh, so it's a great, it was a great system. And uh, we, we were some of the earlier uh, dedications uh, of that system. So that was good fortune too. And it was actually, it could play through uh, a keyboard, a small keyboard that, and we had several recitals actually on the carillons by uh, carillon ears, uh, if they'd be called that. But uh, also it would could, could play by, if you think back of the old player pianos, uh, how there'd be a roll in the player piano that would be punched it was the same technique in that system for the bell. So instead of hitting the chords in the piano, it was hitting the metal bars. That, um, and that's what it still exists today is how it works. It's, it's a magnificent building. Being an outsider coming in, it, it's the first thing you see. And I think it's astounding that, um, and I'm glad that, um, that only the best went into it. And again, it's been remodeled and updated several times, uh, fortunately, because it's made, it's been, uh, it's always been used as a multi-purpose building. It wasn't established just to be for religious services, but to be used for, for many other functions uh, in regards to the academic side. But there's been also many weddings in there uh, of alums and non-alums. Uh, there's been christenings in there. Uh, but it's become a place for performing arts, lectures. Uh, so it's really, uh, it serves well in many ways. Uh, and I think right now today, the food pantry, the student food pantry is located in the, uh, in the chapel. Uh, so it, uh, through the years, has seen, a, again, a renovations, particularly in the chapel proper itself, that have been very advantageous to continued use. And that building gets very, very heavy use, which is wonderful. One name that we see a lot as far as dedication besides Edith Eve was Melvin. What what was the name? Clavin. Phil Clavan. Thank you. Phil Clavan. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Phil Clavan was a, a member of the advisory board and, again, one of those great mentors. Uh, uh, he... He had, when we raised the funds for the uh, uh, SLEP Center, uh, he convinced his brother, who had worked as a volunteer for United Way, Mike Meyer Clavan, uh, convinced him to serve as the lead uh, chair, campaign director, and I worked with him uh, to raise those funds. So Phil was very much uh, uh, in favor of what we were doing and Mike was again a great person to work with he uh, I think he was the one who really convinced his brother that the carillons uh, that he should donate the, the monies for the carillons but but that made it possible so we were raising funds for a campaign uh, for the uh, slept center that we didn't have to go out and hire a, a professional campaign director so Mike had enough experience uh, from his United Way volunteer uh, experience to help us. And a major part of that gift, by the way, for the funds for that came from the Slep family, the whole senior Slep family, and hence the name for the founder of the Altoona Mirror, Harry Slep. It was uh, Dick Truesdale was the one who um, wanted the, the chapel beside the reflecting pond. Yes, part, part yes, of yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, again, Dick was uh, uh, had a lot of vision, and it was very uh, always looking for something that was different. He was a valued member of the architectural firm that he was employed by, who had done several of the buildings on campus, the Smith Building. Uh, so uh, he, he again, he was just because of that na his nature and so understanding. And you suggest something, you would take it. He didn't say, "Get out of here. This is my this is my work." You know, he would take into consideration what you were talking about. And so, uh, as I've said over and over, I, again, had that great experience of working with so many wonderful people that, 
added so much value to my life uh, in regards to what they did and how they worked with people. So at every instance, uh, it was always until I left in, in 78. What were the sports like uh, in your time as as the admin? Well, uh, when I started in 63, we had baseball and basketball. Uh, I think they were our two major sports. And baseball had existed since the very first year at the institution, the Altoona Graduate Center in 1939. Uh, but we didn't have great facilities, you know. Uh, in fact, one of the old-fashioned work days when students would help the uh, take a day off from classes and help do projects on campus. One was clearing out a field up now where the baseball uh, field is, clearing out that area, just trying to have something for a baseball field. So uh, there was never sufficient funds, even to as even today, sufficient funds to have a what I would call a first class uh, athletic program. Uh, but we're getting there, and uh, and with the addition of the slept, or the athletic uh, facility and the additions in the last couple of years, that's really has greatly enhanced uh, the athletic program. But all funding for any athletics it always has been it needs to come from the local budget. Uh, so we've never received uh, really any funding through the athletic program at University Park. So it makes it unique uh, in that we are on our own in regards to building an athletic program. And that's why it's so wonderful to see today that we have a very active athletic advisory council that was just instituted several years ago that will help to advance the athletic program and funding for it, hopefully. Uh, so the... We had some good baseball players and some good basketball players back in those days. And I have to, I always kid Steve Sheets, who's been such an influence and great contributor to the college, that he played on the basketball team during his two years here. Uh, but he'd always say to me, yeah, but I wasn't very good. And I'd say, well, that's true, Steve, but you, you did play. So we've always had fun getting back and forth on that. Uh, but we had some, some wonderful players who, again, the great thing about it is you were able to attract players who weren't, number one, perhaps couldn't afford to go to a four-year institution at the time, but yet could afford to come here as part of their first two years of a great Penn State experience, who were good players, but just weren't out of that caliber that they could receive scholarships. So they had a great opportunity to play. And, and today now, when we can attract four-year and recruit four-year athletes, they, they have that opportunity that they wouldn't have otherwise. Because, again, being that in the NCAA and the, uh, because of the class we're in, we cannot offer athletic scholarships at all. So uh, you have to attract athletes in every other possible way as far as a great opportunity to play, great facilities, uh, and great offerings in many other ways uh, because you can't offer athletic scholarships. And, and the women started their sport teams uh, in 1972. Um, did you have any, what, what recollections of that did you, do you have? Well, with the, with the addition of the uh, athletic complex, uh, the initial phase, the, the, what's just now the auxiliary gym, uh, that gave us an opportunity to expand athletic programs somewhat because prior to that, all the uh, all basketball games or the basketball games were played off campus. We played everything from the YMCA to Key Junior High School. Uh, so wherever we can find a facility, uh, that's where we played. So and that's where they practice. And the practice was limited because, particularly at the Y, because of the other activities at the Y itself. Uh, so the addition of an athletic complex uh, really helped to advance some of the sports. Um, there was a period of time, however, after I left here in my first tenure, that we did not have athletic, the athletic program was, was abandoned for four years. So, which again was unfortunate, but uh, fortunately it, it is where it is today. 
Uh, so we went through a period there, four years, where we didn't have any athletic program at all. Uh, so there was a time when uh, the only thing was intramurals that was available to our students. But it, it's been able to attract uh, some great athletes, and some of those will be honored this October in the first ever Athletic Hall of Fame that we're all looking forward to. Ferdina Engold's going to be one of those. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Ferdina, I've known Ferdina since she was a student during my first tenure here, and we've been longtime friends ever since then. Uh, she went through so much. I mean, she was a coach. She went through that period where we didn't have uh, that void of four years without any athletic program, uh, and then responsible to build it after that. Uh, and did a just an unbelievable job, very, very dedicated uh, woman to everything she's done. She's a great athlete herself, and of course will be honored at the Hall of Fame in October. But uh, she, again, put her full self into uh, everything that she did, not only in her athletic expertise uh, and her athleticism, but, but to building a program from really... Not much. Uh, so it was trying to pull things together in every way you could. And, uh, and over the years, it's built a, what we consider a strong program and a program that we look forward to, to expanding on, uh, eventually adding wrestling back. Wrestling varsity wrestling was on campus for uh, several years. I like to bring back field and track. Uh, so there's other additional programs that could help not only enhance the athletic program, but student recruitment. Uh, because again, we could offer uh, some great facilities for for students along those lines who could attract them. And we're now with our four-year kinesiology program, uh, that combination can really help attract uh, additional students. Ferdina was on the 73 women's basketball team and they were, they went undefeated and won the Western Division Tournament. They yes. were the first team to be undefeated, correct? Yes. And, and, and yes. In fact, I think yeah. that's uh, one of the highlights of her entry uh, for the Hall of Fame. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that so many things have happened over the years. That's one thing that slipped my mind until I saw that her entry uh, for the Hall of Fame uh, but she was great in many other sports, too. And uh, she played, I think it was either him or racquetball with President Spaniard for a number of years. Um, so uh, because she was so good. Uh, that uh, and, and her stature, she, you wouldn't think that she would be the athlete she is. Uh, she's just kind of a small, a small stature physically. And you think, wow. This woman has dynamite. Yeah, she's just in every way. So uh, we've always had a lot of fun together. But I vividly remember her as a student, too, that she was, uh, back then, was very outgoing, very pleasing personality. And it was one of those you just would never forget. So we stayed in touch during the years that I, between 78 and when I come back again, we always stayed in touch uh, about things. And... Uh, always trying to help her when I could. The, the newspaper said you had a spaghetti dinner for them and, and that you burnt something. It was in the newspaper. I, I'm, I'm getting this straight from the newspaper. Yeah, let me think about that. It was the garlic bread, I, if, if I remember correctly. I think correctly. it was the garlic bread, yeah, that we, yes. And I think we were allowed, was that on campus? I think it was at your home. Up. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. So I didn't have to worry about burning anything down then. It was not mine. So, but yeah, well, that, then again, that's the type of feel that we had. You know, we would do things like that uh, to recognize our students. And you're always trying to think of something that's unique. Um, and I must confess, I probably just forgot about that I had that bread <laughs> toasting, you know. <laughs> but, but they, they, anything we do like that, they enjoy. Um, so we always tried to do things like that. Uh, Bob Iker would do that. John Leathers was very good at that. Uh, John lived not too far from the college of Junior had a gap. 
And so he would have a number of student events at his house. Um, so that's, again, what has always made this institution different and great. And I think when you, when you would talk to former students, I think they're the things that they remember about their experience uh, here that it was different and made a better experience for them. Far more personal than just being a number. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But then those years uh, after uh, John Leathers or, or their uh, years that I really wasn't that involved with the college. Um, it was an interesting time that we, they went through a number of different CEOs, as they were called back then. So it was uh, very different. And uh, so it wasn't until Lori Bechtel Wary uh, became the chance that I really come back on a full time basis as a, as a volunteer. Because uh, it was a, she, again, as an individual who you would do practically anything for. And uh, so uh, that made the difference. So to go through those number of years, when I quite honestly had many other interests uh, that uh, before Lori. And that that uh, was one that really to me was uh, I thought, wow, to have a woman like that. And we had worked together as volunteers at American Cancer Society. So we had worked together uh, and did a number of projects jointly that I knew that there was a very special person that I would do practically anything for. Well, I just noticed this. Uh, out of the nine directors, um, she's had the second longest tenure uh, yes. as going. Yes. Uh, but behind Ica, which is yep. going to be almost impossible to beat, but she's yes. been here ever since 2005. Five. Yes, and she, of course, she started as a faculty member, as uh, I'm sure has been donated, denoted, but then then as an academic dean and then named the chancellor. And I can recall, uh, member, remember seeing the faculty have a huge celebration when that was announced. And there's photos of that uh, where they brought her out uh, on one of the lawns and had a big celebration with the announcement of her being named chancellor. Uh, so, but between... Uh, Bob Ica and Lori Bechtelwery, that's where we've seen our greatest achievements in development. Those two really were the ones that uh, made the difference today. So from 1968 to 1975 was John Leather's time. Um, how, how was the campus changing up until close to the end of his tenure? Well, that's at a period. Well, that was a time with a period of growth, um, as far as student population, and then also really building wise too. You know, a number of things that happened uh, during his time, which buildings and enhancements, and also expanding four year, the first two years of the four year programs, um, and and back in those days too the. Associate degree programs were waning, uh, so that there was more and more development in the four year, being able to spend the first two years of a four year program here. Then 1975, we have a Carson Beach, and you were, you were with him from, or worked with him from 1975 to 1978, correct? Yes, yes. And uh, what, what was that like uh, under his tenure? Very different. How so? That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. And then and then you left in 1978? 78, yes. Yeah. Where'd, uh, where did you go to? Uh, I went to... Uh, Mercy Hospital, uh -huh. yeah, and uh, it was uh, Mercy Hospital, which became then Mercy Hospital, Mercy Regional Health System, which became Bon Secours Holy Family Hospital, it was one of two hospitals in Altoona, and was the Catholic hospital. Uh, 
it was owned by the Sisters of Holy Family of Nazareth out of Pittsburgh. They were expanding rapidly, and they were looking for somebody to oversee uh, uh, development there and also uh, uh, public relations and marketing. So I thought it was a great fit uh, to move on from here uh, into that position. And, uh, and I thought, well, if I can be there for five years, uh, that would be great. Uh, ended up being 25 years at the hospital, which was, again, a wonderful experience in many, many ways, and to reach you through so many changes in growth that healthcare was taking, it was taking place in healthcare at that time. And retired, I thought, uh, and then had always been very involved with the American Cancer Society as a volunteer, and uh, was approached then upon my retirement from the hospital system uh, to consider becoming a regional vice president for the American Cancer Society, which I did for the next seven years, and then had my third and final retirement at that point, uh, as far as employment, receiving a paycheck is concerned. Uh, so it was uh, having those three experiences, the college, the healthcare system, and the American Cancer Society was a very uh, great, great experience overall. And, and Lori is the one that wanted you, she, she, she wanted you back. <laughs> it's good stories on, and Lori's very persuasive, as uh, many people know. Uh, she's been very pers persuasive as far as obtaining support from the college. Uh, and so we were in a great period of uh, uh, development at that time at the college. And so at my retirement uh, dinner from the American Cancer Society. It's always a good. She loves telling this story too. Uh, we were at the Calvin House here uh, in the Altoona area, and they always had a huge. Instead of serving a dessert at the table, they had a huge dessert table with a variety of uh, desserts. And we were standing together eating chocolate-covered strawberries. And she said, "Now, David, I think you need to consider coming back again." She said, you need to be like bookends. You started at the college, you need to come back and finish at the college. And so I want you to consider that. I said, Laura, I just retired. Give me a couple months to think about this. All right, I'll give you two months. Well, it ended up nine months before I finally said, okay, let's do it. And, of course, what a, what a great decision that was in my aspect to be able to work with, with her again and to work with people like N. Susan Woodring, who was the director of development and alumni relations at the time, and then also to reintroduce myself to a lot of the faculty that I knew, but then a lot of the new faculty, of course, over those years, had come back to the college and helping them to achieve some of the, uh, the goals that they were looking to do. So uh, she was very persuasive. And what, what years were, was that? Uh, started in, um, yes, yes. So you, uh, you would have retired in 2003 from the Mercy. And then spent seven years with the Cancer Society. Okay, uh, so that's 2010. So, so I'm trying, yeah. It was about seven years. <laughs> okay. Well, we, well, too we, many dates over the years. I know, I know. <laughs> well, we, we were hoping for possibly a, a third interview over over that time. Oh, okay. If if, if you are able and okay. willing. Yeah, because we did a lot of interesting things Yeah, during that time uh, in regards to firming up uh, alumni relations and doing more material along those lines. So that and stewardship, because they were my two main responsibilities in that last tenure with stewardship in alumni relations. And also then with development, too, and helping to achieve some. And it's, and it's almost counterintuitive. You think it was, you know, it was the closest to, to the present time. So, you know, we, we would know the most of it, but we know more of the, of the times that were past as the ones that were closer. So being able to go over those, those years would be uh, helpful um, for us. Yeah. To, um, was there anything that, that, we missed that you wanted to talk about or you would like to mention? Well, uh, again, looking over some of the achievements over the past years, uh, 
we, again, I, I, feel, I felt that we have done a tremendous amount in regards to continued uh, progress and uh, facility-wise and programming. And uh, so it was great coming back when I did into what was happening. And then to see an additional like expansion of the athletic program, uh, the athletic facilities, uh, four-year programs in kinesiology now, and looking forward to several other four-year programs that have been instituted, and still looking at several other four-year programs for the college. So uh, to me, that's something that's uh, very, very special. And as I said earlier, when I can't help but walk through campus every time and think about not only the beauty of the campus when you walk through uh, the campus, but then thinking about what has happened here. Having been associated with the college since actually 1958, uh, so uh, to, and to see how much has happened here. You took classes in the bathhouse. One week. One week, and we weren't skunked at all. Uh, that's one of the great stories about the bathhouse, that every once in a while the skunks would let loose underneath the building, and the building had to be evacuated for a while till it aired out. Uh, but yes, that was... But then also we had the opportunity, we were asked to uh, help furnish the Smith Building because it was finished construction-wise just barely in time to open the opening of the fall semester and so everything was arriving furniture wise so we were asked uh, again by Steve Adler and Bob Ica if we would uh, volunteer our students to help that we could get into our classes faster with new desks and chairs uh, if we'd help unpack them and uh, get them into the classroom so uh, that was that was special but then again as I've mentioned before when we moved into that building, we thought, what more could we ask for? This was totally awesome. Here we had one single building, but we had a couple of new updated labs. We had an actual library. Uh, so it was uh, very special to us to be there uh, and enjoy that. Uh, so uh, for us, it was very special. And we were the ones that inaugurated the building itself. I think the other one too is when there was a, it was the building of the bookstore, because when we were students, the bookstore, quote unquote, was a one room with a counter uh, in the uh, Ivy Hall, which was the student center back then, uh, where you walked up to the counter, and uh, basically you got textbooks there, and that was about it, and a couple of other items that you could buy. Uh, but there was a, it was almost like a storefront, like a you know it was a window with some display case right about below the counter. So you never went into the bookstore; you just stood at the window. So, but that was our bookstore. Uh, so that now we have a self-contained uh, bookstore with many many items. What are some goals or dreams that you'd like to see for the university today? I would like for us to be able to increase student enrollment, uh, which is a very, very difficult thing to do at this time. Uh, but the more that we can do to increase our enrollment, the better off as an institution will be. But we need to qualify, I'm going to qualify that by saying we need to recruit good students. We need to involve our alumni in recruiting. I think we're missing out if we don't involve alums in recruiting. Uh, and there's been a good start by our admissions office in help having alumni involved, but there's many other things that we could do uh, to enhance that. We need to have, I think, uh, hopefully, uh, faster action by the university itself in improving four-year programs. Um, that's always been a contentious thing with me. Uh, in regards to the length of time it takes uh, to have those approvals. Uh, and then also to have the proper facilities uh, for these programs. Now, uh, hopefully with the plans that are underway for additions to and renovations of Smith Building, that we'll have some of those better facilities 
for a couple of our programs. Uh, but the university itself, I think, needs to think about what best they can do, <clears throat> particularly for the four-year campuses. Um, and so it's always been a long dream, a, a, a long time dream to think about what what could be done and how how do you handle that. Uh, the university, of course, as we all know, is a very complex institution. Uh, so, and we're certainly not <laughs> the only one outside University Park. Uh, but I think there's priorities as need to be made in regards to the shortening of qualified students available from from graduate high school graduating classes that are shrinking uh, to to attract. In what ways do we attract some of the best? One of those programs, I think, is the Sheets Fellows Program. And with the Sheets Fellows Program, we need to be going out more and into the high schools themselves and talking to students then, not talking to them once they're here about becoming and being interested in the Sheets Fellows Program, but get these great kids out here in the schools that can uh, be a possible eventual future student uh, Sheets Fellow. And... Steve and Nancy Sheets are making so much available even now to start that program earlier in their collegiate career. To me, that's just going to be a great, uh, great, great program to attract highly qualified students who can then become great alums, in my, in my attitude and opinion. Uh, so that's, that's one of our uh, goals, too, is to make sure that we're doing more and more for our, our, our Penn State Altoona alums. One of our student workers got an internship with Sheets, and we were very happy for her. And it was, um, it, it was a, she had to go through at least three interviews, and, and we were able to, to be kind of part of that and to help her along. And it's, it's really a, a life-changing opportunity for her. Everything that the, uh, the Sheets program does, you know, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that the, the Sheets uh, Corporation is going to make a, a possible reduction in, in tuition for their employees to start here. And uh, so, I mean, that's just another great community uh, venture with, uh, with the college that's not only going to be helpful to us, but it's helpful to their, to their uh, employees. But the, uh, the Sheets Fellows Program, I think, is one of the most unique things that's it's ever really happened as far as uh, what we can offer students. And, uh, and the dedication of Steve and Nancy Sheets to make that program possible and continue to expand upon it. It wasn't a one-time type of uh, consideration. Uh, and the last time I talked to Steve, I was thanking him again for what he and Nancy do. And his main concern was, he says, you know, we're seeing so many students who can barely afford college and are leaving college in great debt. And so that, that's where his thinking is coming from. He, he realizes that he's, he's not looking for recognition of the sheet's name He's always there to help students, and he's recognizing there is that great need that students are leaving and graduating from college with considerable debt, and that if he can help alleviate a little bit of that, that uh, that will be helpful to them. Plus, and then it's a great experience, a great building experience for those students who participate in that program. Did, did you have anything else? I think I'm talked out. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so yes. much for, for doing this again. And hopefully it well, won't be the last time. Well, you know, I, as I've told you all before, I truly appreciate it. I think it's fun to relive and talk about those uh, experiences and those memories. And uh, it's just, and working with you, too, is very gratifying. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um,